Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. After sharp differences have emerged between Anna Hazari's team and the government over the Lokpal bill, what are the principles that should determine its content? That's the key issue I should explore today with National Advisory Council member Aruna Roy. Aruna Roy, let's start with the principles that you believe should determine the content of the Lokpal bill and let's begin with those to do with the ambit and jurisdiction of the bill on which Anna Hazare on the one hand and the government on the other seem to have sharp differences. To begin with, should the Prime Minister and his office be part of the jurisdiction of the Lokpal bill? I definitely think so because the Prime Minister heads many ministries apart from being the head of the government. So I do not think as the head of the executive he can be. There can be some uh, checks and balances, of course, but I d cannot envisage uh, Lokpal Bill leaving the Prime Minister out. What about the argument put forward by two Chief Justices of India, Justice Varma and Justice Venkatachalaya, that the Prime Minister is a, the head of the government. If he becomes dysfunctional, the government will collapse. And secondly, he is the international face of the country. For both these reasons, they argue, the Prime Minister should be exempted from the Lokpal. I don't think that the Prime Minister can be exempted from the purview of the Lokpal Bill, but certainly some aspects of his work which may in fact deter or delay or stall activities, one can examine and look at. Unfortunately, in all these issues, the public and people concerned have not look, really looked at the details and the devil always lies in the details. What are the sort of aspects of his work that you think could be excluded? Maybe some dealing with security, maybe some dealing with other issues which will one have, have to look at the entire list of what he does and then look at what we can keep and what we can't. What about a further check that although the Prime Minister and his office are within the purview of the Lokpal, investigations cannot be undertaken without getting the concurrence of an entity like the Speaker of the Lok Sabha. Would you approve of that? If we bring in prior sanction, then we uh, enter into another domain and even that will have to be examined and I don't quite agree with that sanction being needed, so especially no, in a case of corruption. So no prior sanction but there can be certain areas like national security which are excluded? Yes, similar, and some others will have to have a look at the list of his functioning. In other words, you're taking a position that was suggested by Pranab Mukherjee in his letter to the Chief Minister where he said yes but with exclusions. There will be some but not all exclusions. And the, what will be excluded may be a matter of big debate. Okay, so these exclusions have to be very carefully considered. Yes. A second area of difference between Anna Hazare's team and the government is over the question whether High Court and Supreme Court judges should fall within the purview of the Lokpal. What's your answer to that question? Actually, I think that there must be independent scrutiny of all institutions. The question is whether that independent scrutiny should come within the Lokpal or not. The debate is not whether there should be scrutiny. And there is an argument being proffered and I think that needs to be looked at in more detail again. But now here you're taking a very different position to the one you took earlier on the Prime Minister's issue. Here you're saying there should be scrutiny of judges but it's open to question whether the Lokpal is the right authority to do it. In other words, you could do this through a good, severe, strict judicial accountability bill. You could, because the independence of the judiciary has to be maintained for some kind of sanctity, constitutional sanctity. So one will have to look at it again and revisit the whole business. In other words, here you have an open mind, but you are also at the same time open to the idea that if you have a good judicial accountability bill, that could be the mechanism for scrutinizing the judiciary. Accountability and standards bill, yes. Okay. A third area of difference between the government and the Anna Hazare team is over the question whether MPs particularly their voting and speaking in Parliament should be subject to the purview and jurisdiction of the Lokpal. What's your answer to this? I think they should be under scrutiny. Why not? Well, at the moment, Article 105.2 of the Constitution grants them immunity, which was in a perverse sort of way confirmed when the Supreme Court gave its verdict in the JMM case way back in 98-99. So up to now, the practice and the theory is that what they do or say in Parliament is excluded. You're saying that needs on to be On issues revised. of corruption. Only on issues of corruption. Because the Lokpal deals with issues of corruption. But there was an allegation of corruption against the JMM MPs. And do you remember the Supreme Court with the proviso that bribe givers, not takers, 
were guilty, the Supreme Court excluded MPs on the grounds that you can't go into the motive behind how they voted or why they voted. You're now saying that, in fact, what they do in Parliament will still come under the scrutiny of the Lok Party. On issues of corruption. On issues of corruption. Yes. So that would involve a change in the Constitution. Well, it? one will have to examine what it entails. But is it wise to put a clause into the Lokpal or a principle into the Lokpal bill that actually requires a constitutional amendment when the government of the day may not have the capacity to change the constitution? Actually, if we look at the numbers of times the constitution has really been changed, for the better sometimes and maybe for the worse sometimes, one will have to look at whether it will decrease corruption or not decrease corruption. So in itself, changing the constitution is not an obstacle that should deter? How can I say that when the Constitution has been amended so many times? Let's come to other differences between the government and Anna Hazare, this time not to do with the jurisdiction of the proposed Lokpal, but the powers of the Lokpal. Anna Hazare envisages a Lokpal which would have not just the power to investigate, but to prosecute, to recommend, and in some cases even enforce punishment to redress grievance. In addition, it would have the power to search at will any office or home that it deems fit and also to issue instructions to institutions to change their working practice. Some people say that's just too much power for one single body. So long as these institutions exist, within the, the Lokpal cannot function without investigative powers. It cannot. So long as these are independent areas of functioning, the Lokpal will need them. The idea, the, uh, the real problem is the challenge is to look at how it will function and to look at the details of how it will function. In any case, judgments are given outside the purview of the Lokpal. There will be special courts created for it. But the p question will be, will they be independent? Will they be independent of, of, the, of the overall uh, overarching uh, powers that you give the Lokpal? I think for many people the key issue is this. Should the same one entity, the Lokpal, have both powers to investigate as well as the power to prosecute, or should a different entity be responsible for the prosecution? Provided those two entities are independent of each other and are independent functioning departments, it's okay. One will have to see how it's envisaged. One of the critical problems of this entire debate is that these details are not clear. But, but the assumption that you're making is that provided these can be independent departments of the same Lokpal and truly independent, then it's okay for the same Lokpal to have both functions. But do Chinese walls, as they're called in the West, really operate in India? Don't Chinese walls, forgive this colloquialism, have chinks in them? But the point is that if the Lokpal doesn't have its investigative mechanism, it cannot work. But does it need a prosecuting role as well? That could be debated. We can see whether it needs a prosecuting role or not. My problem is with the Lokpal is that it has not been adequately discussed. You're asking me for opinions. I don't mind giving you off-the-cuff opinions. But we do not know the debates that are going on. My primary concern, even with the principles, is that they're adding grievances. But just, just, just to, I, I can't come to grievances more because it's a very important thing to bring up. But just to get clarity on this issue, if I understand your answer correctly, you're not committed to the position that Anna Hazare's team is committed to, that both prosecution and investigation must be done by the same Lokpal. You're quite happy for the Lokpal to be involved in investigation, but a different entity to take up prosecution when necessary. You're happy for that. You need I'm, a further debate. I'm not saying I'm happy or unhappy. I'm saying I need to understand that issue further before I offer an opinion. Okay. Now... The Lokpal envisaged by Anna Hazare actually goes considerably further. They also see the CVC, the Central Vigilance Commission, coming under the supervision of the Lokpal, and they want the anti-corruption wing of the CBI to function under the Lokpal. Many say that that could end up creating a leviathan. Do you share that fear? I do think that the CVC should be outside the uh, Lokpal's jurisdiction, but it should have the powers to investigate and it should not have prior sanction, which it has today. So it and has to be empowered. Quite right. Empowered, empowered autonomous, but, but outside. outside. What about the anti-corruption wing of the CBI? The anti-corruption wing of the CBI, we'll have to see how it will function within the, within the ambit of the Lokpal, what its role will be, and how independent it will be from the Lokpal itself, because the Lokpal itself 
may have to have its own set of accountabilities. In other words, here you want to know more before you pronounce an opinion. Yes, definitely. Let's then come to the issue you touched on a moment ago, grievances. The Anna Hazare Lokpal extends its mandate not just to cover corruption, but also to redress grievance, which many people believe gives it an opening into the whole area of maladministration and could result in so much work that the Lokpal might collapse under the burden of the tasks it has to take on. Do you think the Lokpal should be restricted to corruption only or should extend to grievance and therefore maladministration? I think the Lokpal should concentrate on high-level corruption, an area which is completely outside the purview of all existing bodies. Grievance redressal is an issue which has to be tackled bottom-up because it concerns very small issues, very critical issues for very poor so people. So this is a clear difference between you and Anna Hazare's views? And the government of India, because that, wants, that doesn't have any problem with grievances being included in the look. Well, we don't really know the government's position on whether grievance should be included or not. The government hasn't revealed its hand. But just to sum up, you're also saying that it's high-level major corruption that the Lokpal should go into, not everyday common petty corruption. I don't think that body will be able to deal with it because the nature of the Lokpal is top-down, whereas local grievances have to be dealt with bottom-up. You cannot, in this present system, give too much power to an individual who represents the Lokpal at the grassroots, maybe the subdivisional level with enormous powers. All right, you've clarified for me certain significant areas where you are in agreement with Anna Hazare, such as the fact that the Prime Minister's office must come under the purview, MPs must come under, areas where you have reservations such as to do with judges or to do with the CVC or the CBI anti-corruption wing, and you have a major difference over grievance. Let's come to two other issues before I take a break. Anna Hazare's team is insistent that the draft of the Lokpal bill must be finalized by the 30th of June, and the government seems to have agreed to that. But given that we have only 25 days left, and as yet, they're still arguing over principles. They haven't even come down to details. Do you think this is a realistic deadline? The Joint Committee has not opened its doors to any public consultation so far. And I do not think that a law of this nature can go through without genuine public consultation on the principles and on the content of the law. So I don't see how this process can be, uh, can be cut short. It's a, it's a very important process. In fact, Anna Hazare not only wants the drafting to finish by the end of June, the 30th of June, but he's insistent that Parliament must pass the bill into law by the 15th of August. Otherwise, he will resume his dharna at Jantar Mantar. Now, given that the monsoon session only begins in the second week of July, that barely gives Parliament four weeks to discuss one of the most important constitutional bills, possibly constitutional amendments the country will see. Is it fair to impose those deadlines on Parliament? I would say, is it fair to the people of India, to people, so many intelligent people have so many opinions on the law, not to be heard once before the law is finalized? So you throw these deadlines out of the window? I don't. I say that the process is more important than a date. The process is more important than a date, which means that don't set deadlines. There has to be a time limit. But not a deadline of... 15th August, for example. I don't know. Maybe we can do it before the 15th of August if they go all out and have so many consultations. All right, if they go all out, but it is unlikely. Let's take a break. I want to come back and approach this issue of the Lokpal and civil society in a slightly different way. That's in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with National Advisory Council member Aruna Roy. Mrs. Roy, let's approach this issue of civil society and the Lokpal Bid a little differently. Should the government have included people like you and Harsh Mandir, who've been involved in working on the Lokpal in the NSC, who have deep interest in the subject in the Joint Drafting Committee? I think Harsh and I have several platforms and we are members of many campaigns and we have enough space to make our comments. I don't think that either of us either want to be in the Joint uh, uh, Drafting Committee nor expected to be in it. What about the government's exclusion of other voices and other people whose opinion should be heard? At the moment, it is just the government and Anna Hazare, and the rest of civil society has no role to play. Should the government be reaching out to multiple voices? I think it should, because I've never really heard a better set of intelligent responses than I have 
read and heard in the last one and a half months. And it makes me proud to be an Indian. So in other words, the drafting of the Lokpal bill must not be a closed shop venture between the government on the one hand and five members from Anna Hazare's side on the other. Actually, no drafting of any bill should be restricted to a small group. It should be discussed in the public domain with large numbers of people. It's only then that you get the best. So it's essential that the government reach out to people very quickly. Yeah, it looks as if there is very little time. Now, these days, far from reaching out to people, the government is repeatedly saying that there are serious differences in civil society over the Lokpat issue. Is that inevitable and natural in a country of 1.3 billion, or does it vitiate and undermine civil society? In a country that claims to have a large intelligentsia, it's inevitable that there'll be very intelligent perceptions which may be different. And I think it's not vitiating, but it's just the right to freedom of expression of opinions and ideas which may, in fact, be different. So the government shouldn't try and score points by pointing this out? Certainly not. Let's come to Baba Ramdev who has started a fast unto death with thousands standing there watching him at the Ram Leela grounds in Delhi. Do you support his fast unto death or do you have serious concerns about his political affiliations as well as his business empire? I do not support his campaign. I'm not part of it. And I certainly have a very strong position on any kind of communally tinged campaign. I think corruption should draw people in from all walks of society and across the board. You can't have one particular group of people, so I, I have nothing to do with a community of people who have, uh, who have a leaning towards a certain kind of religious base. So you do not support Baba Ramdev's campaign? I don't. What about the fact that Baba Ramdev began his fast on Saturday by inviting Sadhvi Ritamra there on stage with him? She's not only a person who is an accused in the Babri Masjid demolition case, but many people remember the communal things she was saying, the communal speeches she was making. Is she a suitable supporter of a campaign against corruption? Corruption means to me many more things than financial corruption. It is, it's also a lack of allegiance to constitutional notions of equality and and rights within the constitution which she has defied. Justice Hegde has said publicly that it doesn't matter that Sadhvi Ritamra is an accused in a Babri Masjid case or that she has been communal in the things she's said and done. If she is against corruption, her support is welcome. You disagree with that interpretation? And I view. wouldn't agree with that. What about Baba Ramdev's fast unto death? Earlier, Anna Hazare undertook a fast unto death. In a democracy, is that an acceptable form of protest or is it unjustifiably coercive? In India, fast unto death has been an accepted mode of protest since Mahatma Gandhi. And I don't think it's coercive, no more than uh, wielding all kinds of uh, uh, caste and other issues uh, and making life miserable for existing governments. No, I don't think so. And what about finally the government's response to Baba Ramdev? The Prime Minister wrote him personal letters, emergency meetings of the Cabinet and the Cabinet Committee for Political Affairs were held. Four ministers went to the airport to receive him when he arrived in Delhi as if he was a visiting head of state. And the general mood created by the government suggests that they're desperate, perhaps they're in panic. Is that an acceptable, suitable, dignified way for the government to behave? Or do you think they're bending at the knee? I think it's appeasement because I remember when the 25,000 tribals came to the same Ramlila grounds, not a single official came to meet them when they wanted to express when their When you point say it's view. appeasement, does that also suggest the government is scared of Baba Ramdev? I don't know why it's doing it. We'll have to look at it, but it's certainly appeasement. Is this a major mistake by the government? We'll have to question the government about why it has appeased, why it wants to appease people like Baba Ramdev. The government Ramdev. is appeasing Baba Ramdev. That's what it appears to be. Mrs. Roy, a pleasure talking to you.